Um, for those of you that don't know Eric, um, he's a local designer and boat builder. Um, and he's been associated with the center for a long time. I don't know how long. <laughs> long enough that um, he's built Valsos and Lake Oswegos and Acme skiffs and probably some other boats and classes here. We have some really cool photos of him in the original boat shop doing class boat building, um, you know, probably in his early years as a boat builder. Um, and so when we were opening the Wagner Education Center, and of course, finding boats we wanted to hang, we wanted to hang his boat because it had so much history with CWB. Um, but more importantly, I wanted Eric to teach a class um, in the new building since he had really taught the bulk of the classes in our past and it had been a solid 15 or 20 years since Eric had done it. And we had been going back and forth about it for a while. Um, but we were able to do that um, for reasons that we'll get into during this uh, talk a little bit. Um, but yeah, we were able to hold, I think, you know, 12 to 15 classes with like around 25 different students um, starting in June of a year ago, June, <laughs> uh, pre pandemic time. And we ran it right until um, literally, right? I think the last class we had was like the end of February um, that I was finding pictures for. So right up until the pandemic hit. Um, and we got really far. Um, students with Eric were able to. You know, build the whole hull. We took it off the mold. We were able to put frames on, starting to put on the interior. Then, of course, um, the pandemic hit, and luckily for us, um, a couple really generous donors and Walt Plimpton and George Corley, who both have long histories with Eric as well, um, stepped up to um, fund basically the boat getting finished with Eric. Um, and what was able to happen was that the boat came out much more beautiful than I think we could have ever imagined. Um, and it's a, it's a true work of art. Um, and so one of the reasons that we built this boat, of course, the whole impetus for getting it started um, was for Shelby. Uh, her father passed away um, right when we were starting this project. And, uh, you know, we started the project as a memorial to her, her father. Um, and so some pictures today here. So today we launched the boat, which is why we're having this uh, third Friday speaker series. And so you can see Shelby, the name of the boat's Big Wave Dave. Um, she can talk about that. And uh, that's her with the name board that she carved and painted. And this is the um, inaugural sail that we had today, or row in this case. And this boat rose like a dream. And um, for many of you, maybe were here and watched it live on um, Zoom with us. So it was really great to, after a year and a half, launch this boat. Um, Shelby and her mom were here, a bunch of her family were on the Zoom. Um, and I'll pass it off to her to talk a little bit. Mm. Mm. You're on mute, Shelby. There we go. Um, hey everyone, thank you so much for being here. Um, today, the launch was just overwhelming and incredible um, for me and my family. Um, yeah, uh, this is, I think, probably the the most like symbolic and best way to represent my father. Um, he, the, the picture on the left um, is him sailing a Hobie cat, um, kind of popping the wheelie, riding a pontoon. Um, he made sailing just feel like magic to me growing up. Um, he had me on a boat before I can remember um, and uh, basically taught me how to sail without me knowing. Um, and uh, one of my favorite memories of him was uh, we were standing across the lake going super fast on our Hobie cat and he told me to take the tiller and drive and I told him I didn't know how to and we were rearing coming up ready to attack and he just refused he's like you have to take the tiller and you know what to do and I did and I knew how um and I think that's a a great way to explain just like him as a boat and like what we should, like how we do things too at, at liveries and like we're, we're gonna let you we're gonna have you get in a boat you're gonna go for a boat ride and and do it um he also um if he heard you say that you want to go for a boat ride he would like follow you up later and make sure that you got that boat ride um so coming down it, having him be a boat or um have him named as a boat for livery um is a perfect bird way for him to um be here and be with us um or me at cwb um, and then to, to pick the, the design of this, like Valsa 16, 
which is very much not a uh, catamaran uh, performance fast uh, Hobie cat, instead a lap straight monohull uh, double masted mis mass lug rig. Um, <laughs> uh, I had in my first year here had spent um, anytime I sailed a new boat, I would call him and tell him about it. And I realized that he was qualifying the boat based on its merits on sailing on the lake, on our lake. Um, and Evalsa 16 is absolutely perfect for sailing on our lake. Um, and it fit all the problems that he had for the, the, the Hopi cat. Um, and we had we'd agreed on that being the next boat for him uh, a while ago. And um, he came up to a festival of ours and saw one in the uh, yard and like came and got me to show me how cool this boat was and that like that's the next boat he wanted um so this just had to be the next boat or the boat to to build in his honor um it was beautiful it rode like an absolute dream today i can't wait to sail it and um i'm really excited to learn more from eric about rigging sailing and uh using it to explore and go around and teach more people about it um yeah and my screen is going but um i have a picture ready oh it's in my office of him who's showing yeah that's him um little me but that's my story with him and uh i'm really excited for everyone to see the boat and see big boy dave down the docks and go for a boat ride Pass it to Eric. Thank you, Eric. Okay, so I'm up, huh? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so I just a lot of you already know some of my history. I'll just briefly go over it again. Uh, so I'm a uh, native Seattleite, <clears throat> and um, grew up on the water. Grew up in Lake Washington. Grew up cruising with my family. Uh, started sailing probably when I was, I don't know, 11, I don't know, 12 years old, really got excited about it. And the bug bit me. Uh, and I was always interested in design. Since I was a little kid, book design, I was always drawing stuff. Um, and when I was, uh, I didn't really go to college. Um, I tried a couple times, but I ended up going to uh, boat building school, trade school in Tacoma. And that's how I got my foot in the door, so to speak. And um, it just happened that uh, a fellow asked me to design and build a boat for him uh, for sailing and rowing uh, of, a, of a particular length, of, of roughly a particular length. And um, that was the 13, that was the Valso 13. Uh, so I, I did that for that fella and it turned out pretty good. And actually that, so that was in 1980, 1980, 40 years, 41 years. And uh, that, actually, that first 13 actually still exists. And uh, somebody in Eastern Washington, I think is, taking care of it. I don't know if it's really usable, but it still exists, it's still out there. So I went to Bates um, and I started working on boats and I just basically started working and kept working and just stayed in the business. Um, so, and eventually there were a number of iterations that grew from that, from the 13 in trade school there. And um, at first the 13 was literally stretched or on, a, on the drawing paper stretched out to about 15 feet. Um, I built a few 13s, I built a few 15s and there's a 15 now in the rowing livery here at the center. Um, and the 16 was really kind of a tweak of the 15 and several years ago, I designed an 18. So there's kind of a, a list of a development of these boats over the years. Um, 
And, and I started teaching at the center really only, I don't know, only a couple of years out of trade school. I got through trade school and moved back up to Seattle and uh, started teaching here pretty soon after that. Um, now I wanted to talk about something I want to talk about the way I learned a little bit in trade school. Um, so I think that we can go to a picture of lining a lap straight boat off. So um, when I was in trade school, uh, I was really kind of learning some of the stuff on my own. My instructor was not really a lap straight guy. So um, to some degree, it was uh, self-taught evolution and um, I read all the I read all the standard books back there all the gardener and and all that stuff and um, designed the 13 uh, but people sometimes notice that these boats this line of HVs have a lot of planks and uh, it's increasingly common to see lots of designs with fewer, planks. So I just want to take a minute or two and kind of explain why that is, um, how the boat is lined off and how the plank lines are established. And it, it goes back to the idea that, uh, first of all, uh, my design work is, is manual. I'm not using computers. I'm not using design programs that um, can come up with plank shapes and all this and that. So it, it goes back to sort of the old fashioned idea of uh, a designer designs a boat, creates a lines drawing, and the builder takes that lines drawing and then figures out how to plank it. So um, when I line off a round bottom boat, like you're looking at, this is actually, we're looking at the 18, but same idea, it's a round bottom, hull and I'm going to plank it in lap straight and uh, let's say in particular I'm going to plank it see the lap straight so uh, the the goal of what I'm trying to figure out when I come up with these plank lines is I'm trying to figure out how to get around the shape of the boat midships in particular without faceting the molds without nicking the molds, keeping the mold shape and just coming up with the spacing of planks that works around that shape. And, um, and particularly with cedar planking, uh, it's gonna be lap straight. So there's gonna be all, all the laps and all this beveling and so on and so forth. And another thing about cedar is that I don't wanna to get too terribly thin on the laps strength. Cedar boat is a traditionally nailed mechanically fastened boat. So the point of all that is to get around that shape uh, without nicking up the molds and, and uh, so that the laps don't get too thin, you end up with something like these pictures. Um, and there, there, there are planking scales that sort of help people kind of line this off. And some people have some mathematical formulas. I don't have any of that. It's just a kind of a by eye and experience thing. And uh, you will, I'll have a relatively wide garboard to start off with. Garboard is the first plank along the keel. So I'll start off with the relatively wide, which might just mean something like six inches in the boat this size. And the geometry, inevitably, I have to, um, when I'm going around the, the tighter curve of the bilge, I have to get down to a narrower plank for the geometry to work. And then as I go towards the, the shear, the top of the boat, I can get wider again. So, that's just the geometry that I'm dealing with. And that's why I end up with so many planks. And it's, it's it'd be a similar idea for plywood, although 
you can go with much thinner edges on plywood structurally. It's still it's still a nuisance to plane a really thin plywood lap. So anyway, so that's why these boats have a lot of planks. That's just the shape I'm working with and my approach to lining them. Um, so uh, so now we've got some we've got some shots of my shop. Uh, so my shop is now at my home in Shoreline. Um, and my business is not just building pretty little lap straight boats. That doesn't really happen all that often, to be honest. Most of my business is uh, repair, restoration, maintenance. So I've got about a thousand square feet in the shop, which is attached to the house. And um, I get all kinds of boats in. I fix boats, I work on boats, I take care of boats. Uh, uh, the, the, the boat on top there is, is a Polsbo boat, it's making the Polsbo boat, very nice. The sailboat to the clockwise is a Norwegian cutter. The wild looking power boat is one of, uh, one of a couple power boat projects I did in the 80s and 90s. Um, that other nice looking boat I think is another 16. Not, not the centers and not my own, but another 16. So um, my business is working on boats. Um, and then, so what I'm gonna start talking about now is the 16. And you're looking now at the lines, at a, a screenshot of, of the lines of the 16 and uh, 16 in frame in my shop. Um, and um, I, have, I have a 16, my boat is a 16. And I have, I have a boat personally because um, I built the first HV 16 in 2000 for a client and that client had to move away and I got the boat back. So that's, that's my personal boat now is a 16 and uh, I've had it since I'm guessing 2007 or eight. And it's funny how, when you actually have a boat, you start learning a lot about it. So um, I got this boat back and um, I found some people that wanted to get out and do stuff and I started doing stuff with the 16. And when I got the boat back initially, it had the original sprit sail rig and all, all the boats, the 13s, 15s, whatever, they'd always just had this simple sprit sail rig. And uh, I, did, I did some cruising with that, had some great adventures. Uh, you know, it's not a bad looking boat with the sprit sail, uh, the picture, on the left is on the sound, Puget Sound. The picture on the right is on the local lake. Um, so I, I did stuff with that boat. Um, I had some adventures. Uh, one, of, one of the memorable adventures was a, uh, a sail from Kingston back to Shulshul with that sprit sail. And I left Kingston with a single reef. And what I can tell you is that I was with a single reef. I'm not gonna try to tell you how hard the wind was blowing or how big the seas were, but I can tell you that I was, I really was surfing most of the way to uh, just above Shoal Shoal. And the picture, uh, the picture where the sail looks funny on our screen here is a scandalized sprit sail. And that was after I had, I had gotten a little bit into the lee of the east shore of the sounds. And I was kind of grateful and exhausted and I uh, was happy that the, the, uh, my, my cross arm of push stick hadn't snapped <laughs> as, I was, as I was holding on for dear life and surfing, surfing down the sound. Um, so I remember that one. Um, the picture on the left is uh, 
with the sprit sail and I'm rowing to um, Mesha Islands. So I did some stuff in the Sound. I did some stuff uh, in San Juans. Um, I, I, the picture on the right, I, that looks like the sprit sail again. And just, you know, I've got the stove out and, and a cup on the forts. Uh, so I, I did uh, some fun, fun and sometimes terrifying things with that rig. Um, you can, on the picture to the right with the stove set, you can see that you're looking at the center thwart, except that it's, it's actually a double thwart. So there was the original single main thwart. And then at some point I, I doubled it up and that was to try tandem rowing. Although um, it, the boat was still trimming down by the bow. So it didn't really work for tandem rowing. But I did eventually, but I do now use, so there are three rowing positions on the boat and I actually use them all for specific reasons. And uh, I think I'll try to get back to that a little later. But uh, so the tandem rowing thing didn't work out so well, but there are other ways to use that seating arrangement. Um, so um, I was using a boat and then um, I had a, I had a friend who some of you might know, our friend James. And James had a, uh, yeah, Dave knows what I'm talking about. James had a, an Uhtred lug yawl and uh, was absolutely adamant about what a great rig this was. <clears throat> um, and um, my friend Tim, who I, we'd done some sprit sail stuff together. Tim had a pea pod and I had my 16. We both had sprit sails. James had this lug yawl. And, um, event, and, and then first uh, Tim converted to a lug yawl, converted to pea pod to a lug yawl. And then after that, I found out that I couldn't keep up with Tim and I couldn't really sail with them. I, my sprit sail really couldn't sail with, uh, with Tim's little y'all. So I finally hit the bullet and um, converted the boat to a lug y'all. Uh, oh, I was gonna say before that, so I'm gonna talk about the changes I've made over this one boat, my boat, the 16 and the design over the years. Uh, bef before I changed to uh, the lug y'all, I, I changed to a push stick. I don't know if we have a picture of that, but, but uh, even with the sprit sail eventually, instead of uh, a conventional tiller with like a long extension, I converted to a, a push stick, a cross arm and a push stick. And that allowed me to get in the middle of the boat, which is often where you need to be to trim it correctly, rowing or sailing, or sailing forward. Um, so I did the push stick thing, and then I did um, the, the lug y'all thing, and we'll talk about more. We'll talk more about the rig. Um, the underbody did some changes to the underbody over time. Uh, so this is this is my boat. Uh, now, when my boat changed, when my sixteen changed to a lug y'all, it was rechristened bandwagon. I named it Bandwagon and it had, had not had a name before, but it was named Bandwagon with the new rig. Um, and over this time of using the boat and uh, adventuring with it, uh, I made some modifi modifications to the center line. So this is, this is uh, my boat, Bandwagon, the 16. And um, it had, uh, first of all, it has a, it has a plank keel. So it has a, the keel swells out in width to about four inches midships and then it tapers at either end. That's a traditional plank keel. And that does a couple things that allows you to, there's room for, uh, there's room to put the center board through that plank keel. And it's also good because the plank keel is wide enough that the boat will just stand upright on its keel. And that's kind of a nice thing, but, um, 
I changed I changed the skeg over time, and I and I actually added a false keel. So um, eventually, what I did was I I um, instead of just a very simple skeg like a fin, very easy to do. I I um, I created a skeg that I call a beach skeg and. So you can imagine the keel is a tapered plank and a beach skeg is a skeg that instead of just a dimensional fin that's an inch and a half thick or whatever, the beach skeg um, follows the shape of the keel. So it's, it, it, it follows that, that tapering width back to the transom. Um, and the skeg is, is fair with the run of the keel. Um, so I did that and that just makes, makes it obviously just easier to drag up and down the beach. Not that you wanna do that a lot, but you know, it's just a, it's a smooth, fair profile, keel profile. Uh, but then I, did, I even did something else. In addition to that is that I added uh, a, a three quarter, another false keel. Another, I added another three quarter inch layer of keel on the bottom of the boat. So, so the net result is this nice smooth profile that's got some, it's got some rocker, some curve, and it's got this uh, plank keel shape that's relatively wide in the middle and then tapers and in width to the ends, and uh, and it's got a um, it's got a VHMW slippery shoe. So it's a very nice shape to haul up on the beach and a little extra keel depth. So, so I end up with about an inch and a half of, um, with the shoe, about an inch and a half of, of keel depth out below the planking. And, um, and I actually felt that was an improvement in tracking and, um, it's just a good setup for landing and it's a nice smooth, fair underbody surface. So that was one of the developments. Um, I'm looking at my notes again. So I, I, I went through some steps with uh, spritz sail and some underbody stuff and some seating arrangements and this and that. And then went to the lug sail and um, that was really cool. Uh, there, there are a couple, there are two, I, uh, there were San Juan trips, Puget Sound trips, and two larger trips that I did with bandwagon and a lug sail in Barkley Sound and then the Broughtons. So there's a couple images from uh, Barkley Sound. Um, uh, one, of, one of these, I, maybe both of them, I think this is in the, in the deer group which is um, you've got the Broken, Broken Island Provincial Park in the middle of Barkley Sound, which is where most people go, which is fabulous. And we cruised around there and then we crossed to the south and went across Imperial Eagle Channel, I think, and went to the, um, the Deer Group. And that anchorage, I remember, felt very, very remote. And, and one, one brief memory is at that anchorage in the Deer Group, I remember, uh, so we were on clotheslines moorings and we often slept on the boats. And I remember not sleeping on the boat through one night, feeling like I was gonna be dashed against the rocks at any moment. The rocks felt like they were just five feet outside the boat and they might've been. It's, it's uh, the, the, the logistics get complicated of putting three, four, five little boats out on a clothesline mooring. That's another, that's another issue. Uh, so this is, uh, yeah, I think this is all Barkley Sound. Uh, you can just a couple shots under my crude sleeping tent. And um, I can sleep in the boat. It often seems like that's the most comfortable thing to do. And you just see all the stuff crammed in the boat. I think you see a sleeping bag in one image where I, I uh, lay out on the floorboards kind of on the port side of the boat. It's actually very comfortable. 
and uh, you can see you see the uh, lug sail winged out and so we did some great stuff up there um, oh i'll point out let me just point out uh, these are more barkley shots uh, on the beach uh, the beach shots would be actually in the broken group itself well something i did before going to barkley sound is that i realized I realized I had to have a pickup rudder. So this is when I finally, uh, I just converted my rudder to a kickup. So that it, it had been a solid piece and I, I tried to figure out the geometry and bit my lip and cut my rudder in half. And uh, this is, you see a picture of the, of the rudder for the new boat, for the center's boats, the blade, the bottom blade and the upper stock. and. Um, those are aluminum cheeks that join them and there's an up hole and a down hole. And so, so uh, a kick up rudder is a requisite for this kind of cruising that we were doing. And uh, I wanna put a plug in for my friend, Alex. So you, uh, Alex, um, so I did Barkley Sound and the Broughtons with Alex Zimmerman. He was one of the gang. And Alex has done a whole lot more than that. And he's written a great book called Becoming Coastal. Uh, he, he describes uh, the trips that I was on with him, but he also describes a lot more mileage up and down the inside passage and kayak trips and so on and so forth. It's really a great book. I highly recommend it. Um, Yeah, so some great, some great sales. Uh, oh, no, no, they were in the Browns. All right. Uh, the Browns was an absolutely amazing trip. And I wrote, uh, so, so Alex writes about it in his book, but I also wrote uh, an article for, for Small Boats Monthly about our Browns trip. And there's just a couple shots from that. Uh, the shot on the left is maybe the first day on uh, Johnstone Strait with a very nice breeze, um, sailing a little bit south to duck around the bottom of Hanson Island. Uh, we were out for five or six days. Uh, I could tell you the itinerary, but maybe I don't need to do that. Uh, it was just a fabulous trip. Um, we saw, we saw or heard humpback whales every day. And then there was one day in Fife Sound that was uh, one of those kind of life experiences. Um, and, uh oh, so there's a picture, oh shoot. There's a picture of a humpback whale on uh, the right tile. But my, but I'm out of the picture. Okay, so I'm in the picture, but it's not showing up. So you see that humpback whale, which is so. What you see there, I suppose, is what two thirds of his length, and I guess I'm just out of the picture to the left uh, with this whale behind me. But that, that, that there was this. That doesn't really convey it. I just, I'll, I'll tell you that I was in some, I was obviously in some upwellings that these, that uh, two humpbacks were feeding in. And um, I was sitting in my boat and they, these two were coming and going all around me. Uh, and it was just incredible. So we, and we all had, close experiences like that that day. Uh, there were there were four boats on this trip, myself and Tim and Alex and James. So there was this one particular hookback day in Fife Sound and then uh, we got to uh, this amazing lagoon after that. And the next morning we were greeted by, we got out of the lagoon the next morning and I think we were greeted by the same two hookbacks that morning. and one of them reached for us. I don't know, really. 
hundred feet away. I don't know where it is. <laughs> we're sitting there drinking our coffee. And there they go. So that trip's been written about. There were many great pilots. It was, it was really wonderful. Um, and this is the 18. So um, my friend Tim pestered me long enough to finally draw lines for another boat, a bigger boat. So that's the, sort of the, um, <clears throat> Uh, the 16, that size boat is, is um, perhaps marginally small for the adventures we were doing. And you know, a little bigger boat would be a bad thing. So um, this is an 18 and a half by five foot four. And uh, I basically drew the lines and then Tim took it from there and fitted it out and built a boat. and. Did the interior and the rig and everything. And uh, Tim, uh, so this this picture is Tim leaving from Shulshol. And um, Tim rode and sailed from Shulshol to Te Telegraph Cove on Vancouver Island. He met up with uh, James for part of that, but he also met up with Alex in the uh, in BC and Alex did did the trip. The two of them did the trip together from the San Juan, uh, from the Gulf Islands to Telegraph Road. And uh, Dave Lesser saw them up there. And yeah, gave them, gave at one point gave them a little bit of uh, helping hand when they were weathered in way up there. Uh, so these are the these are the lines of the 18. Um, there are lines for the 16 also, but uh, but let me just talk about the lines. So the 18 is similar to the 16, and uh, um, I had kind of a spiel here. Uh, so so to me, a, a good so we're dealing with round bottom hulls and drawing round bottom designs, and. Um, to me, what makes a good combination boat is uh, first of all, start with a midsection. And, um, you know, I want a midsection that's not too tender, not like the Oswego boat. Um, not too, you know, not too, not too boxy, not too slack. So it's just, it's just my eye for what seems to be uh, the right, the right um, combination of uh, load carrying and form stability, uh, but still efficiency of movement. Um, and the profile, you know, I, I, sort of, I talked about the profile. So the shear, you know, you wanna give it a nice shear. Uh, you know, one thing, another sort of traditional boat building idea is that um, it's really the builder that ultimately establishes the shear line. Because you can't, on a two dimensional drawing, I mean, a skilled designer knows what that shear is going to look like, but you don't really know what the shear line is going to look like on a two dimensional drawing. So, another antiquated notion is that the builder has last say on what the shear looks like. But anyway. You want to give her a pretty, you know, nice shear line. Um, this is the 18. Uh, it has a little bit of a rounded forefoot. The 16 was actually drawn with a sharp toe and not not so rounded. Uh, but I like the idea of I like the idea of some overhang in the profile. And um, you, st you know, you still want waterline length. For speed, but I like I like some overhang. Um, I want to I want to so I want a body plan midsection that's got some form stability. I want some overhang. Um, I want I want a fine ended load water line, kind of 
kind of a fine entry and, and um, kind of a vaguely double-ended waterline, but uh, how full to draw on the boat at the waterline and how to distribute that volume is probably the, that's kind of the, the real puzzle or the real conundrum when, when I'm drawing something as to how I want to proportion that. And, and the profile, and I talked about the keel profile before. Um, I want I want some rocker. I don't I don't. Although a straight keel would be much easier to build, I don't really want a straight keel. I want some curve to the profile, which we call a rocker. And and I want the I want the profile to have some drag. Drag meaning that the stern sits down a little bit deeper than the bow. Uh, so those are some of the elements that I think are going to give me the handling that I want. Um, I, I actually don't think that uh, rowing and sailing is not just you know just just displacement speed rowing and sailing. It's it's not really that great of a conflict. Um, I want a I want a boat that's comfortable to be in to move around in. Um, uh, so that's that. I want a boat that's comfortable. In other words, so, you know, fine-ended but comfortable, feels secure under foot. Um, okay, so now we've gone. Okay, so Josh, we've gone. Josh has put me to some more pictures of Tim and Alex's trip up the inside passage, um, or at least. As far as tele Telegraph Cove, which by the way is towards the north end of Vancouver Island. So that's a significant trip. Um, on the, you see him dried out. Uh, the 18 is on the left, and Alex's boat is on the right. Alex also designed his own boat and built his own boat. Uh, the right tile, I don't know where it is. It's just a beautiful, it's a picture of. Tim's boat, which is called Haverchuck. Beautiful picture of Tim's boat in some anchorage along the way. And the 18, Tim's boat at the dock. And uh, Tim's boat just out, out there, you know, it sort of gives you a scale of being out amongst the mountains and, and water along the inside passage. Uh, they were on the water for about Five weeks, as I recall. Uh, this is another picture of the 18 of Tim's boat, and, and uh, that's that's his shelter. Uh, so it's just a kind of a hoop awning, um, yeah, versus my crude uh, tarp shelter on bandwagon. Uh, it's kind of a nifty idea. So this awning, and this is something that. I think it started with James probably. So James and Tim and Alex went with this all similar concepts for shelter. So, so this, this two body, they can raise and lower the front and back end so they can kind of really snug it down in the weather or they can keep it higher and keep it kind of open. Um, that actually looks like a picture from the South Sound, but that's Tim's book, but I think it, Looks south sound to me. Anyway. Um, and now I'm going to have some more pictures of my boat bandwagon that kind of show the different modes of travel. This is the so bandwagon. I'm on the left. Uh, the boat on the right is a Caledonia, y'all, but I'm on the left. And this is one mode of travel, which is just kicking back in the back of the boat. And um, you see the, the rudder is kicked up. Uh, you see, uh, this is the, so these are the two masts, right, of the lug rig, the main mast forward. So the mast is up, but the, the lug sail has been dropped. So we just drop the lug sail and stuff it in the 
stuff it beside the boat. And the mizzen is, it's just a little bitty mizzen, it's 10 feet. So it's just a little bitty mizzen that's just wrapped up. And you can see the boom pin. But, but this is a, you know, this is just kicking back on the floorboards leaning against the stern sheets. Very comfortable place to be. That's probably south, that's a south sound picture. Uh, the picture on the left is my boat. And this just illustrates, uh, this is how you can run with this lug sail. It's, you just let it fly out and it almost, you let the, you let the downhaul go and it just kind of shifts to where it's comfortable. And it almost begins to look a little bit like a square sail. Uh, and I, I think I'm standing up back there. So that's, a, that's just kind of a very relaxed downwind run with this kind of a rig. Uh, the picture on the right is, I just think is a wonderful, it's about my favorite picture of the boat. You know, it looks like I'm on a close reach, maybe something like that. The rider's down, obviously. And the leg sail and the little, uh, Little triangular mizzen. Um, yeah, and it's nice. You see that the the, the, bottom, the base of the transom is just kissing the water, just the way you want it. So you know it's a double-ended hull, but you can see the sixteen is picking up some bearing there when it's healing oh. over. Um, the, sh the picture on, on the the left. Upper tile is me again. Now that's how, so when we're out cruising, covering long distances, as anybody knows from this area, winds can be pretty fluky. So part of the point of having a combination boat is to be able to both throw it and sail it. And when the wind's not really working for you, you just row and when we row long distances, we prefer not to have the rig up. So this is what it would look like if I was gonna row for, you know, whatever, half an hour, an hour or all day, which happens plenty of times. Uh, so what I, what I had, would have done is I would have dropped, uh, would have dropped the mainsail and just bundled that up in the boat. And then I would have, I would have just yanked out the main mast, just pulled out the main mast, and slid the heel of the mast under the main thwarts, and it's just kind of sticking out the front of the boat like a bowsprit. And and I also would have, now I'm more I'm more willing to row for a ways with the mizzen up. I mean furled, but up. I might not take that down immediately, but here uh, in this picture, I've also taken down the mizzen. So it's just, it's just a clean robot with nothing up. Uh, and then the picture on the right is just, uh, so, you know, I may be, I may be just race sail or maybe I'm about ready to drop sail. I don't know, but I'm, I'm doing something with the mizzen. Doing something with the mizzen back there. Um, uh, the little, we have a, we have a picture of, uh, of the interior of my boat and there's a funny little fitting on the quarter knee there. And that's my push stick keeper. And that, that is something I like to brag that I worked out myself. I had to, I, I wanted a solution. So so I, I changed from a conventional tiller to a, a cross arm and push stick off of the rudder. So this means, so what I have is I have, I have a long stick. Uh, it's actually about it's eight or nine feet long. And that's what I'm controlling the rudder with. Uh, but I realized that sailing single-handed I, I can't have my hand on the steering or on the push stick all the time. So I need to be able to sail hands-free. So 
this fitting was my solution for um, tending the push stick. And it's, it's, just a, it's just a little wood saddle and there's a pin set in that little saddle. And that pin, uh, so that's, there's a pin in that saddle. And then on the underside of this long push stick, steering stick, I have a, a strip of brass with little holes in it. And the, the pin in that little saddle deal catches one of the holes on the underside of my push stick. So I can just drop the push stick and set it and just set it in that saddle. And, and I have a range of, I have about eight inches to range of adjustment for the push stick and sitting in that saddle. So, and I, and I, I sail a lot hands off. It's, it's really kind of cool. It's, it's nice, it's nice uh, just letting the boat figure out how it wants to sail. You know, trim, trim the rudder and trim, uh, trim the mainsail and sometimes trim the mizzen a little bit. And also, of course, on a boat as small as the 16, it's also all about where you're sitting in the boat, the trim and the behavior of the boat. So, and, and then there's another little shot of uh, a few of us. Uh, I think that's Clark Island and the San Juans. And I think I'm in the back, the boat way in back. And I think my, my mast is sticking out. Um, and uh, there's a goofy picture of me that's fairly old, but looks like I'm enjoying it. And uh, this is another, on the right, another picture of the 16, which just demonstrates another thing I do is I'm very comfortable standing up in the boat. It's a great way to change your position from sitting or crouching or lying on the floorboards all day is just to stand up. So, oh yeah, and you can see the push stick, I think. So I'm standing up very comfortable I've got the push, the steering push stick in my uh, right hand. Uh, the oars, the, the way I stow my oars when I'm cruising or just out sailing is uh, the handle of the oars is up at the bow and the blades of the oars are, are sitting in the forward oar lock. And I, I, I think there's just kind of a simple line I've got them lashed down with so I don't lose them. Uh, but this is just me standing up in the boat, very comfortable. And uh, part of the logic of this y'all, these two sticks, two sails arrangement is to get them separated so that there's actually a space that you can stand up in the towards the back of the boat and be clear of the mainsail. So I can stand at the back of the boat and, and uh, the sail can swing in front of me. I can tack, I can tack while I'm standing up. It's not a problem. Um, and now we're gonna get into some details of, of the balanced lug. So I keep, I've been saying lug all this time. There's different flavors of lug sails. This is a balanced lug sail where um, the luff is entirely forward of the mast. And uh, pretty much by definition, that means it has a boom, has a boom, it has a top yard. Um, uh, the picture on the left is just the mast top. It's just showing you that I use a sheave we use the halyard sheaves on our masts for the for the lug sail halyard. Um, the next, the center picture is is the back end of the sail. So there's several things going on there. Um, the sail's got it's it's got uh, it's got a lashing. The the clue of the sail has just a lashing around the boom obviously and, and it has a outhaul and the other line you see is the reefing the slab reefing line for the back of the sail the leech and this is how uh, I have three uh, I have three reefing positions on my lug sail and this is how the reef 
on the leech, the aft prefaceta. So um, it's going through a carabiner. It's, it's uh, the, the line that starts with the wrap around the boom and then it goes up and through that carabiner. The carabiner is uh, at the first reefing position. And then the reefing line goes back down. It just goes through the boom, just like a bee hole and then forward to a clam cleat. So that's where, that's where my reefing lives. It just lives like that. It's always attached to the first reefing position. Um, so that's part of the reefing sequence and that's what the back looks like. Uh, the tile, uh, the picture to the right, that's showing the down, that's the forward end of the sail of the boom and that's showing the down hull which is uh, like a three to one, I guess, which is a little bit overkill, but uh, it's better to have more down hole than less. I would never pull that down hole as hard as I possibly could, uh, but I, I can, I will at times give it a lot of tension and that, that gets into how the characteristics of the lug sail. Do we have a, Josh, do we have the main sheet? Picture of the main sheet. Yeah, okay, so um, so the upper left picture is, that's the main sheet. So this, so Van Wagen has what I would call mid boom sheeting. Uh, so the sheet's not at the end of the boom. It's, it's uh, you know, a little ways along the boom and you can see that it's just, the sheet is just forward of my rowing thwart. The sheet is anchored to a, um, an eye strap with very long screws going into the centerboard trunk. So I really like this arrangement. So this keeps the sheet out of, out of the cockpit, out of my way. Uh, you know, it's also nice because you use, the sheet is shorter. You know, you're, you're reeling in and out less sheet to trim the sail with the mid boom location like this. Um, the, okay, and then we have, the halyard. So that funny looking ring is, that's what we call the halyard traveler for the lug sail. And uh, you can see it, that's down towards the base of the mast there, you see the hook, and then you see the sail raised using that traveler. So, so looking at that traveler fitting, the rope coming off the top is the halyard. And what happens is that the, the hook part of that fitting of that traveler, you just, you literally hang the yard of the lug sail on that hook and raise the sail. So it's real easy, raise and lower the sail. You know, you can, you can drop the sail with that and then you can just detach the, detach the yard and detach the entire sail bundle from the mast. Uh, yeah, so we like, we like, I'm definitely sold on, the, on that right now that I've used it, thanks to James twisting our arms. Um, so I think we'll talk about act, the actual construction of the center's new boat which as Josh said, started out here. And um, you see um, the top there, you see us just starting to plank over the molds. So uh, what happened was that I brought my molds in and uh, backbone patterns. That's what we started off with, but with uh, my molds and my backbone patterns. And we made the backbone here. And um, I think I talked about the line off, but we didn't really do the line off again because the molds and my patterns have already been marked for that. This, uh, this, is, this is the, I don't know, maybe the fifth boat that's the fifth 16 that's come off of these molds. So that sort of gave us a leg up, you know, having those patterns and so forth. 
So it's lap straight. That means that you got to plank from the keel up. It's unfortunate for the students because they have to do the hardest plank first. <laughs> they have to do the hardest plank first, the guard room. But, you know, we get through that. <clears throat> um, the, the, um, so you see the molds. So we're going we're gonna to plank over the molds and then we're going to pull it off and rib it out later. Uh, uh, the, the cutouts, the cutouts and the molds are for clamping because we're kind of, we're clamping the planks as we go along here. Um, those are the garbage on. Uh, we would have, we would have put the garbage on with uh, bedding compound and ring nails and then, um, and, and the, the, the plank lines, the, the molds have all been marked for the plank lines, for the, for the run of the planks, uh, which is what enables you to pattern the planking as you proceed. But with, with the lap straight, you got to get a plank on, uh, then you've got to uh, plane a landing on that plank for the next plank. That's the lap, the slap straight. So you put a plank on, you bevel the edge, you uh, spiral or pattern the next plank, put that on, nail it, so on and so forth. Uh, with this boat, the first three or four planks are steamed. Really, it's just for the bow to get the twist in the bow. Uh, and this is, uh, this is red cedar, if I didn't say that already. This is um, precious, precious, old growth, super tight vertical grain red cedar, which is, which is the only thing I really want to build this kind of boat with. This shall be, uh, there's the boat pretty much plank, you know, planked up. There's, there's a plank. No, oh, that might be a spiling. I think on the right side, we might have a spiling. I call it a spiling batten. It's not a batten like a skinny little cedar batten. It's a, um, I think that's what I'm looking at. No, it's a plank. <laughs> it's a plank. Uh, but all the planks would have been patterned or, or what I call spiled. And that's done with uh, basically some thin plywood. Um, you, you put up some thin plywood uh, that, that kind of falls within the shape of the plank that you're trying to pattern. In other words, it falls, you put up some plywood, some plywood that falls within the marks on the boat for the next plank. And uh, I have a particular method of spiling, which I don't think is, oh, which I think is unique and which I think is uh, minimize the confusion. So these guys that plank the boat, they learned all that stuff. Um, and uh, the boat's got nine, nine strakes. Um, <clears throat> that kind of goes back to my, uh, you know, back to trade school and how I, how I learned or how I developed my planking techniques for this kind of boat. Um, yeah. So the boat's planked up and you see the planked shell that we would have just pulled off the molds here at the center. And then um, we bent the ribs in here at the center. So, this, so the only steaming in the process really is uh, the first three or four planks, and then of course the ribs are steamed. So the ribs are um, white oak, nice, moist, fresh cut white oak. Uh, oh, another thing about this boat and the way I've always built these boats is that um, the cedar boats is that they're clinch nailed uh, rather than riveted. So a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, folks might rivet 
these holes together, everything riveted, the, the ribs riveted. Uh, sometimes people will rivet the ribs and clench nail between the ribs. There's a line, uh, so so you've got you've got the you've got the overlapping lap straight planking, and and basically there's a fastening every couple of inches uh, down each lap, and some of those fastenings are the rib fastenings, but there are also more nails in between the ribs. Anyway, so I use clinch nails, uh, which are um, <clears throat> a little skinny, soft, cop malleable copper nails which are, you still pilot a hole for them and they're tapped through from the outside and then uh, you use a, an iron, uh, you use a piece of metal <laughs> to curl the tips of the nails back into the wood inside the boat. Um, so I just got into that habit from the, from the outset, I guess, from the very first boat I built. Uh, on these boat later, you might see that the, the, the rub rails, the gunnels on the boat are riveted. That's the only thing that's riveted. But the hull, the planking and the ribs are clinch nail. So, excuse me, so we're bending in the ribs and there's a whole, there's a whole sequence and process to that, which, uh, which uh, the students learned they are lining off and uh, pre-drilling and clench nailing technique, uh, steam bending and all that stuff. Uh, the, the, the whole interior is just saturated with sea fin teak oil. And, and the ribs are, um, are coated with uh, linseed oil or some kind of boat soup mixture before they go in the steam box. And that does a couple of things actually. The linseed oil keeps, I think, keeps them uh, keeps them from drying out as quickly when they come out of the box. And and I think it just kind of pre-seals the ribs. Uh, we've cut the centerboard slot. The kid, the centerboard slot was cut when the backbone was assembled. At the beginning of the process, okay, you can see that just plank yeah, anyway, here. Yeah, so we're bending in the ribs, and that went just fine, as I recall. Uh, upper upper left corner is working on fitting a quarter knee. The the, the quarter knees and the breast hook might be the are, are a couple of the more complex and rewarding pieces to fit. So you see them fitting a quarter knee and then you see the finished quarter knee. Um, and uh, you see the, the picture on the right, kind of an overall view of details. Well, uh, one, of the, one of the things about, about these boats, about the HVs, the way I execute them is that, um, so there's a fair amount of transom crown. The, the top of the transom has a good amount of curve and the, the, the quarter knees are fared around that or fared into that. And the same thing with the breast hook. I don't know if we have a picture of the breast hook, but the breast hook is also very carefully carved and shaped and, and fared. So, you go around the top of the boat, all around the top of the boat, you've got this sculptural kind of surface with the rails blending into the breast hook and across the other side and down the rails and around the quarter knees and the transom crown. Uh, you see different ways of setting quarter knees, but, but this is what I do. I just do this overall fairing job. Uh, there's a yeah. There's a uh, there's a breast hook. I think in the upper left. That's a that's the breast hook for the new boat. When when we were doing this here, I brought my boat. I brought bandwagon down a fair amount of the time, so students were able to uh, look at my boat. I was able to look at my boat and remember what was going on. <laughs> 
that was very helpful. And and um, and the uh, the the upper left picture again, where you see the breast hook, but you also see uh, so you see the this uh, kind of removable foredeck surface, and then you see um, my mast is is uh, kind of boxed in. I mean, it's boxed in by the the thwart and the mass partner, but there's another cleats on top of that again. And um, you see, you see an eye, eye bolt for the downhaul of the lug sail. Yeah, that's the that's for the downhaul. And you see, you, you just kind of see a, a mast gate, which is not not really necessary. I, I've used that gate once in an emergency. When it would have been difficult to actually yank the mast down, but other than that, we didn't fit the new boat with the gate. It's not, I don't think it's terribly important. Um, and uh, the picture. Uh, oh, so that's me. Okay, so that's me and my shop on the right. So we 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 planked and ribbed the hull, and we got the rails on. And yeah, we got a lot done. We got the rails on. We got the main thwarts in centerboard trunk and then uh, I took the boat back to my shop and um, and finished it so finished some more carpentry uh, uh, the stern the stern seats sheets uh, the stern seating and all the knees and supports for that um, and uh, finishing the the shear and the rails and the knees and the, uh, you know, paint and varnish and, and doing the floorboards. Um, that's another, another kind of a proprietary thing of mine is how I do the floorboards. Uh, it's a lot of work. So the floorboards consist of four independent panels. Uh, 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 two panels, port and starboard, and um, these floorboards are uh, the, the panels are are discrete, separate units that just drop into the boat, and um, so that involves uh, and, and and the floorboard panels are shaped are shaped to the boat, so they just they sit on the existing ribs of the boat, so you can imagine that. There's a lot of shaping there, so there, uh, the the ribs, uh, the little ribs of the panels, and the actual cedar boards of the panels that create the overall floorboard panel. That's all steam bent stuff. That's all the little ribs are steam and bent, bent in to follow the shape of the boat, the bottom shape of the boat, and then the floorboards are. It's kind of like doing the planking again. The shape of the floorboards mimics the planking, and it's, but it's all steamed and shaped so that they just fit into the bottom of the boat and and, and conform to that shape. There's no there's no floor timbers, if anybody knows what I mean by that. So it's just it's just it's it's basically simple dinghy construction in terms of um, just gunnel to gunnel ribs, full length ribs, and. Um, the floorboard sit on top of those, but but the point is that the floorboards are not fastened to the hull ribs. They're not damaging the boat in any way. They're, just, uh, they're completely separate but secure inside the boat. Uh, <clears throat> so this is this is at this back at the center, and uh, there's a stern shot with the boom pin, and um, so there has to be so the the, the mizzen. You can see is uh, very far aft. Uh, the the actual um, boat. Let's go back, Josh. We had an interior. Can we see the? Maybe go back one more. Yeah, on the right. That's just looking back before the stern seats are in, and you can see the the mizzen step. And um, uh, there's a, there's just a little pin basically. At the base of the transom, on the on the right side of the transom, the uh, the the mizzen just uh, drops onto this little pin. It slips through this kind of 
what you could call the mast partner, I guess, and seats on a pin and that's, and that's it. So, um, so because the mizzen is way back there, um, it needs to have a bumpkin to lead the sheet to. Yeah, right there. So you got the, you got the bumpkin, you got the kick up rudder hanging down there. You can see, you can see the cross arm coming off of the rudder. Yeah, so that's a purple heart cross arm. And then you see the push stick uh, going forward and uh, sitting in, in that sitting in that little saddle deal that I was talking about earlier. So that's that's the setup. That's basically the setup. Uh, and that's a close up of the kick up rudder again with the uh, that white line is is the uphaul and anyway. Yeah, and then that's just another picture of the boat all glossy. <clears throat> so that's a lot of the stuff that I had notes on. Uh, if any fire away at any any questions or anything you want to get into. I know it's too much information, right? So what what portions are, are actually glued or you just marry the strakes together? So that there's no- The strakes are not glued. That's a great question. They're not glued uh, because this is a traditionally fastened cedar boat, but they are bedded. So there's a bead of, of polysulfide. There's a bead of boat life running down the middle of the lap of each plank. Ah. The, 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 obviously the, the perimeter of the planks, like the, the first plank, the garber, you know, everything is bedded against the keel and the transom and the stem, but there's also a bead running down the lap. So, um, so when I, when I build one of these boats in my shop, I absolutely expect it to be dry and never take on water. It's going to be a dry boat. And my boat lives on a trailer in the side yard. Second question. So I'll yep. see it. Have you ever had a knockdown? I've never had a knockdown. Um, I've, I've, I've been where I knew that I needed to drop the sail and put a reef in, which is the point of having three sets of reef lines. And the point of, this is the point of the yawl rig. Oh, I didn't talk about that at all. So, so okay, let me try to describe that. So, the, so this little mizzen on this boat, really it's uh, basically it's, for heaving to. Basically the mizzen is to settle the boat in a stable position into the wind where you can then deal with the mainsail or, the, or, or so where then you can raise lower or reef the mainsail. So the, the mizzen isn't driving the boat really. Um, uh, a lot of the time, Probably most of the time, the mizzen when, when I'm sailing, the mizzen is just sheeted just enough to take out the flutter. I mean, I might, I might, I might adjust. I can get a little helm balance adjustment with the mizzen, but the primary use of the mizzen is um, to get to get the bow of the boat into the wind in a stable position and, and sitting there, and that has to do with the rudder. The rudder and the mizzen, and so to get the boat in that position, so you can raise lower or reef the sail. So the way you the way you get that the, the boat in that position, the way you heave to with this rig 
is because um, you don't you don't have a jib, right? So instead of a jib, you have this little mizzen. So the deal is, um, you um, might be hard to explain, but you 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 set the rudder. <clears throat> I would be setting I would be setting the rudder. I guess to port. Um, I set the rudder so that so that. Uh, if I'm so, if I'm just I'm just floating there, right, no, no, with nothing on the sails, I'm just floating free. Uh, I I'm going to set the rudder so that I'm going to cock the rudder over, and the boat's going to start drifting back, and it's going to start swinging around according to how the rudder sets. But the mizzen is sheeted in, and the mizzen is going to push the bow back up. So the rudder is cocked over so that it, so that it, the, the boat would drift back around on that, but, but the mizzen is sheeted in and it's keeping the bow up. And so those two forces, those two forces are counteracting each other and they're keeping the boat in a stable position um, you know, I don't know, 20, 30 degrees, 20 degrees off the wind. And so I want to get the boat, I want the boat to be, I want the boat to be kind of pointed into the wind so that I can raise and lower the lug sail and it drops into the boat. It doesn't drop into the water outside the boat. I want the sail to drop into the boat. So I, I need so I need to have the bow up into the wind. I mean not not luffing, right? Not dead into the wind, but 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 uh, pretty pretty close up into the wind and then the sail just drops into the boat. Or I just or I raise the sail out of the boat, the mainsail. So that's that's how I'm heaving too. So I so I know when I'm out in the open and I'm not running into the beach isn't an option or I don't have time to do something like that. I know that I can always uh, I can always release the mainsail, just let the lug sail fly, and another another this lug sail, this uh, this standing lug sail is a very docile, it's very docile. It's, it doesn't, it doesn't luff like a sail does that's attached to a mast. It's just this big panel and you can just let it go and it's perfectly calm and it'll just swing off. And, and, um, and it's, it's not luffing, it's just, it's just not in the wind. It's just streaming. It's just streaming without luffing. So you can just let her off, let the main sail go and sheet in the mizzen and you can have you can have the rudder and the mizzen in these two kind of opposing positions, and that keeps the boat up in the wind. And you can just sit there. You can sit there through anything. You can have lunch, take a nap, have lunch, drop the drop the main sail to reef it. So you know it's it's uh, you know. Um, you know that you could, there's going to be too much wind, and you know you got to get that down and reduce sail there. So that's how you do it, keeping the bow into the wind, and that's what the mizzen is for. Um, and that's that's what it's for, uh, and sometimes a little bit of helm trim. And it is true that if you're um, it doesn't happen very often, but if you're not, if you're kind of not aware, the, the mizzen, if you don't release the mizzen on attack, sometimes it could get you into irons. That's another little thing to remember. You don't want, you don't want the mizzen to interfere with attack. So it's just kind of hanging out back there. It's like you're, it's like you're a crew person and your safety blanket and everything. I forget what the original question was, but. Eric, I have a question. Um, when you yep. took the small boats up to the Broughtons, yeah. did you sail them all the way up there? Did you trade? No, 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 um, 
you trailered them somewhere. Well, so, so Tim has gone all the way. Tim and Alex and these guys have gone all the way up there. But no, we for that trip we trailered to Alder Bay. You know Alder Bay? Yeah. Yes. Great place. Casual, wonderful place. It's it's uh, Alder Bay is on Vancouver Island. Uh, it's quite near. Uh, it's just below Alert Bay on right. the Vancouver Island side. Yeah. I, well, so we I've sailed been, out of there. Yeah, I've been up there many times in in the big boat that I used to own, the Olympus. Yeah. They built um you built a bunch of beautiful stuff for that boat, Olympus. Hatch yeah, cover. A little bit of work, yeah. Yeah. Your boats are beautiful. Oh, thank you. Anybody else? Is there anything I can talk about? Anything else I can talk about? Uh, I'm listening. I'll just see if there's anything else I was really excited about mentioning. <clears throat> uh, again, big plug for Alex Zimmerman's book, Going Postal. It, it's, um, he doesn't sugarcoat it. Alex doesn't sugarcoat it. I mean, uh, I, I think he, I think he expresses how wonderful it is, but he also expresses how much work this can be, and you know, the long days of rowing and the different conditions you have to deal with. Um, uh, I didn't talk about one of the things I thought of was uh, talking about was just the different ways we handle the boats on the beach. Um, so you, when you do this, you, you, you learn what a, um, oh, the name just went up my brain. <clears throat> well, one, one tool is, is, um, is this elastic thing that you attach, oh, anchor buddy. So there's something called an anchor buddy. That's one tool. So that is uh, basically a, a bungee cord that you attach to the boat and to the anchor, and and you have um, you have to kind of for for um, for a lunch stop or uh, if there's very little exchange tidal exchange over the night, you might get away with using an anchor, buddy. So it's just this elastic thing that's attached to the anchor. And then attached to the boat, and you, you throw the anchor out, and so now the boat is on a bungee cord, and um, you can um, you would have a line going to shore. So the boat is between a bungee and an anchor, and a line to shore, and you can pull the boat in and out with this bungee deal. So um, that's a good tool, and and then. Um, we use clothesline systems, which is much more set up, uh, but that's where the boat is basically just on a long loop uh, between the anchor and shore, and you and you you reel the boat in and out, basically on this really long loop. And I. Uh, <clears throat> On those trips up north, I had a, I had a four hundred foot clothesline, so I could, in theory, get my boat, you know, to uh, almost two hundred feet off the beach if I wanted to. And there was there was one place where I used every bit of that. Uh, I think some of the Tim and Alex may, may, may have actually had 600 foot clotheslines when they did the longer trip. Uh, but a clothesline is, is one of the tools for 10. And that's part of, part of the arts of this kind of activity is learning how to tend the boat. So um, anchor buddy is one way, clothesline is another way. The easiest way to tend the boat, of course, is just to uh, make your beach stop and then just row back out and drop the hook. And so that we do that a lot also. 
Hey, we have a question here, Eric. Uh, how small of a line did you have in order to fit that much line in the boat? Uh, so my so my ground tackle all all fits up in the bow under this uh, kind of bow platform thing, and so the ground um, the 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 clothesline, the clothesline is a quarter inch float line. Samson makes a float line. And, and I, learned, uh, I learned the hard way that a sinking clothesline is not good. A floating clothesline is better. So it's, it's 400 feet of quarter inch clothesline. And, I, and I'm able to just, you know, you just put, put that ground tackle in and, in and out in the right sequence and it's just all flaked into the front part of the boat and the so 400 feet of that and um on the big trips I'm, i might have had 100 feet of anchor and road a, a little five pound band forth and maybe 10 feet of chain and maybe 100 feet of road and there was one there was one place uh that i used all of that Road. Um, yeah. I had another uh, question, which was yep. just, um, why do you like having the rig down for rowing? Uh, just not having any top half, top hamper. It's. Um, I think these. This at least my boat is small enough. That you can you can feel the difference in the way it's you can feel a difference between having the stick up there, even though it's just the stick, even just the mast, it feels different having it up there than having it down. It feels better, you know. It feels better having nothing, nothing up top. <clears throat> That's my story. I'm sticking to it. Eric. Also, uh, also, just and the also just the mast. You know, it's hard to keep. Uh, most masts don't fit like perfectly. You don't want the mast to fit tightly into the partner, right? So, the mast is probably going to be knocking around a little bit if you're just rowing along. And so, so, for for any length of time rowing, we also would rather have the rig completely down. Go ahead. Well, yeah, Eric, when did you uh, shift your building technique from bending? Because I remember when we built the, the 13s that um, building with you that, that you bent the frames over ribbons first. Yeah. Then you planked. And, and yeah. at what time did the light bulb go on? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's kind of, I think that's kind of a funny story. So the first, yeah, the, the 13. Well, I still have the original setup, right? And it's set up for uh, rib ends and ribs first and planking over that. So, okay, so the reason for that is that I think I might've mentioned that when I was in trade school, my, my instructor, bless, great guy, very knowledgeable guy, but he didn't, he was not really um, familiar with lap strike. I don't think he was really familiar with lap strike. Well, yeah, he was, Trumby was a big, a big boat. Well, I, no, I didn't have, I didn't have Trumbly. I just oh. missed Trumbly. I had John Posine. And I don't think John, it's, we were learning lap straight kind of ourselves. There were two or three of us doing lap straight at school. So I don't think John was that familiar with it. And so his, his orientation, his boat building orientation was, was, uh, you know, more Carville orientation. So molds and ribbands and ribs and then the plank. Um, so I, I don't think, I don't think doing it that way, it's not crazy. I don't, I don't, I've never set up another boat that way. Uh, it has, there's some advantages to doing the ribbands, ribs, and then planking. But uh, on balance, it's 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 not the easiest way to build. It's just more straightforward to plank over molds and then rivet out. But but that that's why because I, I don't think John knew any better. So 
So that was his suggestion. Like, well, do this. Okay, that's what we did. Well, any other questions from anyone before we let Eric go? Eric, how many Valso of various sizes are out there floating around making people happy? Well, you know, unfortunately, they're really expensive. <laughs> so <laughs> there's, not, there's not a whole lot. I mean, I don't know. There might be. Uh, I don't have a good sense of that. Uh, I've probably built. Um, well, including classes, the boats that I've built for clients and boats that I've built in classes. I, honestly, I don't know. It might be. It's, I'm sure it's no more than 25. Maybe. Um, I'll add that we have one for sale in our boats for sale program. Yeah. Oh, that was yeah. Called, what, 20 years ago, something like that? Yeah, yeah. There's a really, there's a pretty stunning 13, um, which I guess is for sale. I don't know. I've heard that, but it's, it, it was donated. So not this boat in back of me, but uh, another 13 that started as a class boat. And, um, and then I guess one of the students uh, paid for the materials and took it home and, and finished it, or 99% finished it. He never got it sailing, but he did a beautiful, beautiful job. Pretty stunning job of finishing this boat. A lot of mahogany, virgin, varnished kaya mahogany forts in the whole nine yards and, um, he did he did a he did kind of a panel floorboard system not exactly like i do it but but um he did something so he didn't just fasten the floorboards into the ribs of the hull <clears throat> so i don't i don't know i think people tend to assume there's more of them out there than there really are. But there, there's a few, and the, there's a few, there's a handful in Europe. Um, I didn't, I, I mentioned teaching here, but I also um, did some teaching in BC and I did a couple of, a uh, um, couple of deals in, uh, in the Netherlands. And um, <clears throat> there's a handful of boats of my boats in Europe. Uh, I just heard about one the other day, so. Well, I can say that the center is very lucky to have another gorgeous example. <laughs> uh, and everyone wants to come see it, please do. Um, happy to show it off. Thank you so much for contributing another, Eric. You betcha. And giving a great presentation. New, 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 uh, new skill set to learn with that rig. Yeah, uh, I learned a lot from listening to your presentation. I took down some notes for equipment to add for cruising. Um, mm -hmm. So I think you want an inventory list for your cruising. Um, <laughs> I think other people might want some notes on that. Um, but if we're getting close to nine. Um, sorry, I end it. But um, thank you so much, Eric. Uh, this was a great presentation. Um, lots of great photographs and information. Um, and we'll have the recording available, I believe, uh, for everyone. Yep, yep, in nods. And um, yeah, get information if you like a boat from Eric. Uh, you can contact us for that too, or work on your boat. Any um, kind of boat. Any, anything, anything. Any kind you of can boat. Hatch anything. It for uh, uh, your own uh, classic yacht, too. I didn't yep. know that. <laughs> um, yeah. Or advice on modifying your rig, whatever. Eric can do it. Several really nice boats, like nonchalant. Eric could fix it up for you. Yeah. 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 Again, most. <laughs> he does most leathering. The... He does varnish. He does anything. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We'll talk Eric up. All you need. Um, yeah. Thank, thanks, Eric. Um, I have a I have a tip mouse, a sixteen foot tip mouse. Oh yeah. Oh, that's a Rabel. I remember. 
Rabel's book. Yeah, I'm and I'm going to I'm going to bring it to the Center for Wooden Boats. It, we're going to try to get some scouts involved in working on it and could cool. like it's been here. No. Pardon? It's been here. Is that our festival last year? Yes, it was. Yeah. It, it, it's quite a boat. It's it's not lapstrake, but it's it's actually glued with uh, fiberglass glue, and, but it's very heavy. And the reason I asked you about going over, if you've ever swamped the boat, I had mine swamped once. And for a thousand pound boat filled with water, this makes it a whole different story. Yeah. Well, I've done a, I've done a capsize test. Uh, let me say one thing about the 18 and the way Tim finished the boat out and just the, the general idea behind it. So um, the 18 is the plywood, plywood lap straight or Tim's boat is plywood lap straight. I've started the second hull that's been sitting forever, plywood lap straight. And, the, and the, both, both these 18 hulls have large fore and aft buoyancy tanks. Uh, so um, with you know the problem of swamping in mind or the, the eventual eventuality of swamping. Um, but my 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 cedar boat, my you know, bandwagon doesn't have any dedicated flotation or any of that stuff. So it would be kind of a nuisance for it to swamp. I try to I avoid that. I managed to avoid that all that time. So it's all about knowing when to reef, reef, er, reef early and reef often, right? Yeah, yeah it, it, it certainly depends on where you're at. Mike, I was out in 20 knot winds and all of a sudden it was 30. And uh, yeah. And then you fill a boat. So what I did is put a put a cuddy cabin on it, and take up a lot of that volume. So yeah. well, we'll we'll we'll, uh, we'll talk more. Thank you very very much for your presentation. You I really enjoyed it. I'm I'm Doug Meacham. So. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks to uh, Josh and everybody for putting. I just gave Josh a whole bunch of pictures and wrote kind of an outline. So Josh put together this uh, presentation. Great job, thank you. All that business school education I got. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. PowerPoint. Yeah. <clears throat> See, well, thank you very much, Eric. This is great. Uh, thank you for building the boat, coming to the launch and having the launch today. That was really wonderful. Um, and thank you to everyone who, um, watch this presentation. I think we are up to almost 48 people at its peak, which is the pretty, or I think it's up there for the most amount of people we had to attend any CWB virtual uh, talk at least. So congrats to all of you, this is pretty good. All right. So. Cool. Great. Okay. Eric. Cheers to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for attending. everybody. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. <laughs>